All right. So what uh, we saw at the, in the second part of the last lecture was that in uh, uh, two dimensions, uh, a series of field theories, which actually encode, uh, cover the most interesting physical cases, uh, allow for the existence of uh, non-trivial conservation laws. And uh, we saw also how the, the existence of these non-trivial conservation laws constrain in a very severe way the uh, scattering theory for these field theories. So we saw two main uh, important uh, simplifications as a consequence of what we call the integrability. So this implies for the scattering problem, first of all, what we call the complete elasticity. Which means that uh, the final state is kinematically identical to the initial one. And the second was uh, the uh, factorization. of uh, multi-particle scattering amplitudes into the product of two body amplitudes. So uh, today we are going to see the consequences of this. And in particular, factorization implies that the, for these the integrable theories, the problem of uh, determining the S matrix is reduced to that to determine the to body scattering. So we will be dealing with two body scattering for which we use the usual pictorial representation. So these are indices that uh, denote dif possibly different species of particles. Uh, then uh, the scattering, we, now we are away from uh, criticality, will depend on uh, the momenta of these particles. And a, a very useful thing to do from the very beginning here is to introduce this so-called rapidity parametrization for energy and momentum, which implements directly the uh, relativistic dispersion relation. A consequence of this uh, parametrization in terms of rapidity theta is that uh, this uh, transforms very easily also under, uh, sorry, under a relativistic transformation. The rapidity is just shift. in such a way that quantities which are uh, relativistic invariant will depend only on differences of rapidities. Okay. So in my picture here, I'm going to denote the moment uh, through the rapidities. I have theta 1, theta 2, theta 1, theta 2. And uh, so the amplitude is a relativistic invariant. So this will be a function, S, A, B, C, D, of theta 1 minus theta 2. Uh, in particular, the relativistic invariant S that we used repeated, uh, repeatedly in our considerations which was this one. Now in the rapid uh, representation is becomes for two particles with the same mass m can be written this way. Is the square root of the center of mass uh, energy. Uh,
Now, this, this uh, relation uh, actually allows uh, some additional considerations which are quite uh, important for uh, setting the problem. So let's go, uh, we discussed at length the analytic structure of the scattering amplitudes uh, in, the, uh, in this complex plane S. And uh, we say there, there, are, there was, there were unitarity cuts. The first one starting at f uh, 4m square. Then there were the crossed image of these cuts. due to, to, to crossing symmetry. And then, uh, this was just the first of this cut, there were additional others in the general case, but now, since we are dealing with these integrable theories, complete elasticity implies that these are the only cuts uh, present for the amplitude, because we have no production process. So we have this uh, uh, important simplification of the analytic structure. Then, of course, we have always the bound state poles, which are allowed. Uh, now, uh, in this rapidity parametrization, we can translate now this analytic structure of the amplitude in the plane of uh, the variable theta one minus theta two, and zero. We have this branch point here, which is mapped here in the origin, while this other branch point for the cross cut is mapped here in i pi. Then we can exploit the fact that the correspondence between the rapidity difference and S is not one-to-one. -one. You see this, particularly if I change the sign of T1 minus T2, I get the same S. So if I call here one, two, three, and four, the different ages of these cuts, I can map these uh, edges into different regions different pieces here in of the ax this axis in the theta plane in this way one two three four in such a way that you understand that uh, uh, so this mapping from s to theta uh, allows me to get rid of the cuts. So I'm resolving this uh, multi-sheeted uh, structure here. This was a Riemann surface. And I'm mapping uh, different sheets of this Riemann surface into different strips of uh, width i pi in the theta plane. Because this is periodic in the imaginary direction of theta one minus theta two. In particular, this uh, strip here is called the physical strip. And uh, the poles that you have here, so this interval is mapped in this interval and the poles will, will appear here. Uh, so in the, in the theta plane, the amplitude has no cuts, but only poles due to bound states. And uh, a, a function which has this property, uh, so has only poles as singularity, is called the meromorphic function. So this is a mathematical name. So this uh, restricts the space of functions in which you have to, uh, we have to look for solution to the space of meromorphic functions. 
uh, now we can easily also translate the unitary decrossing equations that we had uh, in, the S, in the S variable, in, in the theta variable, they take this uh, form. So the unitarity combined with the real analyticity actually was a relation between these two edges of the cut, which now becomes a relation between these two points. And so uh, this is something you can write this way. Sorry. While the crossing, crossing was relating a point here to a point here. So here becomes something like that. In particular, S, A, B, C, D, theta, S, D, bar, A. Okay, so these are crossing unitarity, and now essentially we have the rules of the game and we can look for solutions. Um, in looking for solutions, of course, uh, uh, it makes sense to, to start from the simplest possible case. The simplest possible case in is that in which uh, when you do the scattering here, also the indices of the particles in the initial state are preserved in the final state. So I have A here again, B here. This is called pure transmission. Now, for pure transmission, uh, so we are saying that we are looking now to uh, AB, AB, theta 1 minus theta 2. And for this, uh, I can use uh, a short test notation, uh, of course, which will be this one. So, unitary decrossing just becomes SAB. Theta S A B minus theta equal one and S A B theta equal S B bar A I prime minus theta. Now one th one thing one can see is that uh, the general solution for the unitary equation, this one. So, uh, so w once you ask that uh, the function has to be meromorphic, it has to be real analytic. Let me say real analyticity. Uh, if you remember, it, it was saying that passing from upper edge or to lower edge of the cat, you have uh, actually a complex conjugation. This implies in particular that in between these two branch points here, the amplitude is real, which means it is real here in the theta plane on this imaginary axis. So you ask uh, meromorphicity, real analyticity, and uh, you ask also that the asymptotic behavior at large energy is uh, reasonable. I mean, it doesn't grow more than polynomially in the energy. <coughs> then uh, under these conditions, which are quite general, so the general solution for unitarity is the following. 
in this pure transmissive case, you can write the amplitudes as a product of b elementary blocks F alpha defined in this way. There is a periodicity in alpha, so it is sufficient to consider alpha in this interval. Now you see in this uh, in these uh, blocks in general you have poles, and these poles we know if they fall into this portion of the axis or the imaginary axis, they will be bound state poles uh, under actually under conditions that I will specify now. So le let's have a look to these bound state poles. So the amplitude, say, will have a pole at the value theta minus I U A B C with the residue that I write in the form A B C square. This is the behavior when theta is close to this value U A B C and this U A B C So it has to be on this piece of the imaginary axis. So I take out this factor of i because for real analyticity I want the amplitude to be real on that axis. Uh, so this gamma here, uh, here is real and gamma square will be positive if this is a genuine pole in the what one we call the direct channel. So pictorially I represent this in this way. I have my particles which are scattering A and B. I have always A and B in the final state, but I have this bound state C, which arise in this channel and I associate these three vertex, uh, three particle vertex gamma ABC, so is a constant which specify the strength of the bound state to each of these two vertices which gives me the square here. So by construction this residue up, up to the factor of i, so this gamma square here, the residue of a pole in the direct channel is uh, positive. Direct channel bound state pole has positive residue. On the other hand, due to crossing symmetry, this pole will have also an image in the cross channel when I look at, at the amplitude this way. But since crossing, uh, the crossing relation looks like this, the, the residue in the cross channel will have the negative residue because I have this minus theta. So cross channel pole cross-channel pole have negative residue. And so looking at the sign of the residue, I can distinguish between the two. Okay, so these are the rules of the game for purely transmissive scattering. And now we can really go and examine some solutions. Um. 
let me start from the simple. Of course, the uh, free theories are trivial examples of this uh, in this class. But among the free theories, we know we have one which is uh, interesting, it's which is the easy model. So the easy model, we know, is a theory of a free massive, away from criticality will be massive, neutral fermion. So I have just one particle in the game. I have no indices on my amplitude. And the amplitude is minus 1 for the fermionic statistics. Uh, so in particular, this means that in our picture where we move the theory away from criticality, adding to the action of the term uh, energy density times deviation from critical temperature tau. In this theory, this is uh, this fermionic mass term, psi psi bar. Well, now you see. Uh, in this fermionic theory, changing the sign of tau, namely passing from high temperature to low temperature, doesn't change really the nature of the theory. It is always a free fermion. So this S equal minus 1 works both above and below Tc. Now, this, uh, the fact that uh, the amplitudes are the same above and below Tc in this particle formalism is the signature of a duality of the theory. And indeed, it is well known that the easy model possesses such a duality with, on the lattice, which is called, in that context, kramers warner duality. So we see here, in this way, the amplitudes are the same. On the other hand, the physics is different above and below Tc. So where do we see the difference in the physics? Well, the point is that uh, above Tc, there is a single uh, vacuum. Let me call it like this. And the particles are excitations above this vacuum. Below this C, on the other end, there are two degenerate vacua. So the one with two ferromagnetic vacua one uh, all the spin plus, the other corresponding to spin uh, negative, the symmetry broken in the other direction. Now, in, two, in one plus one dimensions, whenever you have the generate discrete vacua, the elementary excitations are topological. They are kinks interpolating between these two, uh, this discrete set of vacua. In this case, they are two. So let me use this pictorial representation. This is the plus vacuum, this is the minus vacuum. So the excitations are the kinks going, say, I call here k plus minus, is a kink going from plus to minus, and the other object is k minus plus. Is the kink going the way uh, back? So in such a way that we have to interpret the amplitude in terms of these uh, excitations. So our S of theta below Tc, well, let me say that the general state then in this kink basis will be like this, something like k plus minus theta i, k minus plus theta i plus 1, and and so on. In this case, with just work, where you can all uh, simply go back and forth between the two. So plus minus theta i plus 2, and so on. This is the most general state. And s of theta below Tc is, pictorially, is, is this. So you can have 
plus plus minus minus which by spin reversal symmetry is also equal to the other possibility which is minus minus plus plus and this is minus one so the amplitude is always minus one but the difference in is uh, in the interpretation of the excitations and we will see later how this leads to different correlation functions in the two phases okay so this is the easing case So now let me do another example. I, now I do, uh, I play the game the way around. I start from the particle content and then I try to figure out which, which theory I'm describing. So let me start this time from, suppose my theory has, has ele elementary excitations, a doublet of particles, A and A bar which are uh, charge conjugated particles with the same mass m and uh, charges which are opposite say q minus q now now we look for it solution with with interaction so it's not a constant in in, in the rapidity and uh, well the the solution of unitarity is already here we have to solve only the crossing with a b taking these two in uh, values a and a bar and you can check easily that a solution to crossing is uh, this one of course the theory is invariant under charge conjugation so SA a is equal to S a bar a bar and so so these are all the amplitudes they satisfy unitarity and crossing uh, then what about bound states well uh, this if you look to this uh, amplitude in the AA channel, this is a pole at theta equal 2 pi i over 3. So I'm looking at this channel here, AA. So for a value of rapidity difference 2 i pi over 3, there is a pole. And if you check the residue on this pole, you will see, you will see that it is positive. So this is a bound state. So I'm producing a particle here. So there is such a bound state in this channel. This value of theta, of the rapidity difference, if you go and plug into the formula giving S in terms of theta 1 minus theta 2, will give you for the mass of this bound state again the mass m the same mass of a and a bar so the particle i'm uh, the bound state here i don't want to be a new particle with the same mass because i already said what's my particle content at, the, at that uh, value of the mass so it has to be either a or a bar it cannot be A because you, you cannot conserve the charge in that case for a Q which is non-zero. So it has to be A bar. So this means that we have a implementing a rule at the vertex that 2K is equal, uh, 2Q is equal Q, charge conservation. 
uh, sorry, minus Q, or if you prefer, 3Q equals zero. So this theory constructed this way possesses a Z3 symmetry. So this identification of the charge modulo 3 implies a Z3 symmetry. But we also add in the theory also the charge conjugation C. The C, uh, this relay is so C applied to A is equal to A bar. And th with this product of these two objects, you can do uh, a full permutational group of three elements. So th this is the simplest uh, field theory possessing an S3 symmetry. And of course, on universality grounds, we expect this to be related to the uh, three-state POTS model, to be the solution for the three-state POTS model. Now, implicitly, in doing this, I have worked above TC because I worked with ordinary particles. So implicitly, this is a three-state POTS model above TC. What about below TC? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. This is we are in the purely transmissive uh, case. So T less than TC it works uh, as follows. Now we have three, we know, uh, we have in the POTS model below TC, we have three degenerate vacua. which are then of this way. And associated to this, we have the kings uh, interpolating between them, k, okay, alpha, beta. So we have a structure like, like this, three vacua, one, two, three, and the kings running among them, between them. Uh, Due to the permutational symmetry, we have three, only three independent amplitudes we can construct, which are the following. Or say one, two, three, two. One, one, two, three. One, one. These are the three inequivalent cases up to permutations of the colors one, two, and three. Now, if we say that the kink k going from alpha to alpha plus one mod three, we associate it to a label A, a particle A while k alpha to alpha minus one, mod three. We associate it to a particle A bar. So under these identifications, we, we can rewrite these three amplitudes in the following way. So this is for one, two, so I'm going up, this is A. This is two, three, I'm going up again, this is A again. One, two, this is A, or, uh, always, and this is always A. On the other end here, I have A, A bar, and the last one is A, A bar. So through this uh, correspondence between kinks and particles, I can map the, the amplitudes below TC to those above TC. And of course, uh, 
the solu in, the, in this way, the, solutions I the solution I found above this C can be used also below. So I, I have this amplitude here, which is this. The second one is this one. And the third one, which is uh, non uh, purely transmissive, this will be zero in this mapping with the solution above TC. So I can have uh, the same amplitudes above and below TC, and again, this is manifestation of duality, which is known to be present for the POTS model also on the lattice. Okay, so this is illustrates uh, the case of pure transmission. Now I will give an example Yes. Uh, not for the POTS model. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, there is a subtlety there. So let me say, uh, for the POTS model, you know there must be the duality. And so you want the same amplitudes above and below. And this is how it works. And you are forced to set to zero, the last one. Uh, this is the case of the ferromagnetic POTS model. If you go to the anti-ferromagnetic POTS model, there you always have the S3 symmetry. But also for anti-ferromagnets, the lattice play, plays a role. For anti-ferromagnet, the spins want to be anti-parallel, so the lattice matters. So you have to discuss which lattice you are, you are solving. In particular, if you go to the square lattice, uh, there is a second order transition. The central charge is one. And uh, uh, what happens is that there is a symmetry coming from the lattice, kind of Z2 symmetry, exchanging even an odd sub lattice, which combines with the S3 symmetry coming from the Hamiltonian. Putting the two together, you end with, uh, in a particular case of the sine Gordon model, which I'm going to discuss. So uh, that's a case in which the last amplitude is non zero, but the S3 symmetry combined with the lattice symmetry is somehow hidden. You can find. Uh, you can find it if you look to the symmetry of the uh, spin field uh, and uh, the staggered magnetization we have uh, in the POTS model. Uh, you, can do, you can do this analysis and realize that uh, there is such hidden ZT symmetry which is combined uh, to the lattice symmetry to uh, produce the a specific case of the same Gordon model, in which also this uh, amplitude is non-zero. Okay. So I, I was saying actually that to illustrate the case in which uh, reflection is allowed, I will discuss uh, the case of the same Gordon model which is particularly relevant because St. Gordon is the uh, scaling limit of a lot of uh, models like the 8 vertex model, the Ashkin Teller model that I hope I will mention at some point in more detail, or the anti ferromagnetic models. I mentioned one example right now. Uh, so let's go and so now reflection allowed and the example is sine Gordon. Oh. 
What's sign guard? Well, sign guard is a name we give to an object that we already implicitly know. The action is the following. So we start with the free massless, bos massless boson that we discussed at length in, in the second lecture. But now we, we want to go away from criticality, so we add the energy density. So, which for this model we had called cosine to beta phi. So this was the energy density for the boson. And so this, uh, this theory goes under the name of sine Gordon. And uh, uh, it follows from uh, the discussion of the second lecture also that this bosonic uh, theory allows also for a fermionic representation. This is the fermionization that we discussed. So the fermionized version will be I do it in terms of two uh, real or Majorana fermions, Psi 1 and Psi 2. Then uh, now I'm away from criticality, I add the mass term. So this is the energy term corresponding to each Majorana. So this epsilon, ER total epsilon is epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2. And then uh, up to now these are uh, decoupled. There is a coupling which depends on the B I have in the bosonic action. And the coupling is for fermion. And we know that this G, we had identified the free fermion point to be B squared equal to one half. So at that point, G must be zero. Okay, so we have these two ways of looking at this theory, bosonic and fermionic. What about the particle content, the elementary excitations? Well, uh, if we look first to the fermionic uh, representation, we have complex fermions, psi, that I can write as in terms of the real ones this way. Uh, and to these fields is natural to associate particles, a particle A, which I can also write in terms of two neutral particles, A1, A2. There will be also a complex conjugate of this guy associated to a particle, which is the, comp the conjugate, the antiparticle of A, A bar. So these are uh, natural elementary excitations associated to the fermions. But of course, this must be also uh, the same elementary excitations in the bosonic version. But in the bosonic version, we have the point is that we have this potential, which is periodic. And so we again we have the minima of this potential correspond to the genet vacua of the theory. We have a discrete set of them. And so again, there will be topological excitations interpolating between this. And so we call A and A bar the topological excitations connecting a vacuum to the one to his uh, right and the one to the its left. And in the, in the St. Gordon language, in the Bosonian language, these are called 
soliton and anti-soliton. So this is soliton. This is the anti-soliton. So in such a way that you see that the, the fermionic charge in the bosonic language becomes a topological charge for the soliton. Now the sine gordon model is integrable. The integrability doesn't follow from uh, the counting argument that we saw for uh, C less than one theories, where we, are, we were using the the generate fields and, and so on. Here we are at C equal one. Uh, but actually, for this case, the integrability was known long before it was discovered for the case C less than one. Just because this theory you see, you have uh, uh, Lagrangians, and they can be analyzed with traditional methods. For example, you, you do perturbation theory, and you check that any process uh, which has more than two particles in the final state as zero amplitude, order by order in perturbation theory. And this is a signature of integrability. So this is integrable, and so this means we can play the game uh, in this case. We have to deal with, with the two body amplitudes. And there are three of them. So one is AA going to AA. Up to charge conjugation, they are three. I call this S0 of theta. Then you can do AA bar, which goes to AA bar. So this is transmission of the charge. So th I call this ST. But now you can also do reflection. A, A bar going to A bar A. So you have an amplitude in general SR, SR of theta. Now these three uh, amplitudes are related by crossing, first of all. So S0 in the direct channel is like ST in the cross channel. <coughs> While SR is crossing invariant. This is crossing. Then you do unitarity. So unitarity, for uh, we know this game. Uh, we have, for example, things like this. Suppose I work with the channel AA bar, and uh, I want to go back to AA bar <coughs> in such a way that I pick up one. But with these amplitudes, there are two ways of getting or going from here to here. So this one is. I can do two transmissions. But also two reflections will do. So this is one equation. And then in, if you uh, here instead go to A bar A, this time the final state is different from the initial one, so you get zero. And this is something you obtain doing one transmission and one reflection, or first the reflection and then the transmission. If instead you go in the channel AA, the, that's diagonal uh, necessarily by conservation of charge, and you get this.
So these are the three unitary equations. Uh, now, however, due to the presence of reflection, Also, the factorization equations uh, become non-trivial and, and give uh, some uh, non-trivial constraint because you can do now something like that if you consider three particles. Suppose we, we start with the initial state A, A bar, A. So we are scattering this this way. And uh, let's take as a final state here a bar, a, a. So you can choose these external indices. You, you, can, you can do the same uh, reasoning for all possibilities of so the external indices. I'm, I do this example now. Well, you see, uh, in this case, if you look at here, I have a, a which means that these two particles can on only be by charge conservation again a a so uh, and then this forces this particle to be a bar because here i have a bar zero charge and i have to have zero charge here so in this case, this is the only possibility for this, this choice of initial and final indices. And, uh, um, but this, due to the possibility we have in these integral theories to shift the trajectories of the particles without changing, changing the chronological order of the sub-processes, but without changing the total amplitude, this has to be equal to now. Well, the external indices are always the same, so this is. Uh, sorry, here there is a mistake. This is a. a. Oh, yes, a a bar gives a a a bar. So this was a. Sorry. Uh, such a way that here you have A again, A bar, A. The final was A, A bar, A, A, A bar. Now I... So let me say here, uh, let me add this. In the vertices, I have the scattering. We, I have three possibilities, 0, T, and R. So I can put here the labels, R. Here was a reflection. Here is a transmission. And here is 0. Here you can do, you can go from this initial configuration to the final configuration, doing first the transmission, which gives you A, A bar. Then zero here, which gives you A here, and then a reflection. But this is not the only possibility, because you can do the same process. Doing first here a reflection which gives now a, a bar. And then you do a reflection here with a bar and a transmission here. So this is a pictorial uh, identity that you can translate in an actual equation. If I call theta prime the rapidity difference between these two particles, so uh, yes, theta prime, theta this, and this then will be theta plus theta prime. The equation becomes SR of theta prime 
S T of theta plus theta prime S zero of theta equal S T of theta S zero theta plus theta prime. And then you have uh, something similar with plus your R R T. which is the second term. Okay, so this is an example of a non-trivial factorization equation. Uh, this is just to say uh, these are the constraints that you need to solve to find this solution. I have no time at all to, to go into this. Uh, and uh, I, uh, to, to go, I mean, into the details of the solution, I will write it down straight away. So the first amplitude takes this form. Sorry, wrong. This is This is the transmission amplitude. Takes this form. Uh, while the reflection is Now you can check that this uh, equation, this uh, amplitude satisfy this uh, uh, factorization equation because you see the factor S0 appears in all three and this is a homogeneous equation. It doesn't depend actually on the form of S0. But when you go and solve a, a unitarity and crossing, uh, S0 of course is constrained by that. And uh, the result for S0 <laughs> So what you do is to solve uh, unitary crossing in a basis uh, as a product of gamma functions. Gamma functions are the basic functions which contain only poles. So the basic meromorphic functions. And then uh, it turns out to solve the equations, you have to take an infinite product of these gamma functions. And then you can write the solution of S0 in a compact form using a formula for the gamma function uh, in a form of the integral representation. It takes this form, minus exponential. So it's quite non-trivial. But our main point is to see the property of the solution. So t over 2, 1 minus xi over pi. This is it. So this is the solution of the St. Gordon model. And you see that, first of all, this solution allows for a parameter xi, which of course has to be there, because the action contains uh, a parameter, which is b in the bosonic language, and g, which I erased in the fermionic language. Uh, so, in particular, this xi is a function of b, of b square, if you prefer. Uh, 
Well, if you look at xi equal pi, the solution uh, simplifies a lot because you get that the reflection vanishes while the transmission and the S0 become minus 1 identically. So this means that xi equal pi is the free fermion point. And so we know that xi of 1 half is pi. B squared 1 half is the free fermion point. We know that. Uh, now, this, the relation between xi and b for other values of b is non-trivial, but implicitly we are already solved this problem. Indeed, if we take the limit theta going to infinity of the transmission amplitude, this becomes a phase is exponential minus i pi over 2 i plus pi over xi. It follows from the solution. But what, what does it mean taking this limit? You see, this is the limit in which the energy of the particle divided by its mass goes to infinity. So this is a massless limit, namely a scale invariant limit. And scale invariant, uh, th the scale invariant theory is the, so the limit in which we are considering the, the massless boson, which we solved in the previous lecture. And in the previous lecture, we saw this phase. We saw the phase for the scattering amplitude in the bosonic theory. So we know that this phase in this massless limit has too much the result that we had found for the phase in the scale invariant theory, which was exponential. If you take the notes, it, it was this. Then matching the two, we get xi equal pi b squared over one mi minus b squared. which is a non-trivial relation between the parameter in the S matrix and the parameter in the Lagrangian. Uh, now, we know that uh, B square was the dimension, actually, of the energy density. We, we want this to be less than 1, to have a new positive. And so this implies that Xi is a positive number. So the solution we found can be can correspond to an axis parameterized by xi in which the value xi equal pi is the free fermion point. Then we can go and look to these amplitudes here and we see they have poles. The factor S0 has no poles. It can be analyzed. has no poles in the region which can provide bound states. So the only poles are come from this hyperbolic sign in the denominator sphere. And if you analyze them, you, see, you will see that they correspond to bound states. So we are in the channel A, A bar. A, A bar. There are poles corresponding to a, a charge which is zero. I call B and these particles. And the masses of these particles B n, I call them M n. They are from the position of the pole I extract the mass of the bound state. In this case is two M sine and xi over 2, where m is the mass of the soliton. Okay. So this is the spectrum of bound states. And in order to, uh, to be in the physical strip, there is a limitation on n. This n is an integer. 
going from 1 to the integer part or pi of pi over xi. This is the condition we have to impose in such a way that these poles do not go outside the physical strip allowed for bound states. So this gives, then, you see, a structure. This means that above this value, above the free fermion point, you have no bound states. This is a rep repulsive region in the solidon and antisolidon scattering. On the other end, below the free fermion point, you start having bound states, and their number increases as xi, xi, as xi decreases. In particular, so in this region here, you have only B1. But then in this region, you have B1 and B2. Then in this region, you have B1, B2, and B3, okay, and so on and so forth. One, thing, one, uh, one observation we can do is that the lightest of these bound states, B1, is naturally associated to the field phi in the bosonic Lagrangian. And you see that above this free fermion point, which is B squared equal to 1 half, this, this particle disappears from the theory. It's no longer in the spectrum. So this is a very non-trivial effect of quantum field theory of, uh, at uh, st strong coupling. So the, the natural particle associated to, to the field in the Lagrangian disappears completely. Okay, so this is time for the break. And uh, as I say, this, uh, in terms of this theory, then you can describe the scaling limit of uh, a large number of uh, interesting models. And I will uh, hopefully the next time uh, give some examples. Okay, so I, we do the break if you have questions, of course. <laughs> After the break. <laughs> Okay, so we gave enough examples of how this uh, uh, problem of scattering in integrable theories can be, so can be solved. And now in the second part of this lecture, I will discuss uh, the next problem, uh, which comes naturally following this logic, which is that of going from these uh, solutions in terms of particles to uh, making contact with the fields and then computing correlation functions. So we know that correlation functions in this framework are something we obtain introducing between the two fields a resolution of the identity in this form. And uh, this is why the problem is reduced to that of the determination of the matrix element between the vacuum or the field with some generic field phi between the vacuum and an end particle state that I will characterize by the rapidities of the particles. I will not put the indices for the species, so I, I will con 
consider the case of a single species which is enough to understand how this works without complicating the notation. Uh, so again, uh, this form is called the form factor. And we can use for it uh, a pictorial <laughs> representation like this. Okay, the, the point is that in, this, in the integrable theories, these form factors can also be determined exactly uh, once you know the S matrix. And the way this is done is through the solution of a set of uh, equations satisfied by these matrix elements that uh, I now illustrate briefly. Uh, so there is a first equation, which is quite obvious. It says that if I take a form factor, I can exchange the order of two rapidities uh, and when when I do that, I produce a scattering amplitude because I'm exchanging these two particles on the line. This is, I get S theta i minus S theta i plus one. So that's quite obvious. There is a second one. Which can be written in this form. Theta one plus i pi. So what's the meaning of this equation? Here you see what I have is that uh, I'm shift uh, shifting by a factor, uh, I term i pi, the rapidity of the first particle. If you repent, uh, remember the rapidity parameterization, a shift uh, by i pi means that I'm reversing the energy and momentum of this particle. And this operation is something that we learned uh, is related to crossing. So pictorially, what I'm doing So I'm taking the, the, this first particle and I'm crossing it from this state, initial state, say, to the final state, adding this i pi. So morally, this is what I'm doing. But uh, you see, I can do this operation in two ways, because I could do pictorially always this as follows. So this is always theta 2, theta n. This was theta 1. I could cross it taking the other direction. But if I do that, I, I pick all the scattering amplitudes with the remaining particles. And a scattering amplitude corresponds to uh, interchanging opposition according to the previous equation. And this is what this equation is telling me. So these two ways of doing the analytic continuation uh, are related. Now there is a third equation. Which says that if I take a form factor with n plus two particles, theta prime, theta, theta one, theta n. And for the first two, I take them uh, with the rapidity difference of i pi. Then uh, this matrix element will have a pole. 
So there will be a residue on this pole when theta prime is equal to theta plus i pi. You see, this rapidity difference means that these two particles, say one has energy and momentum E p, and the other one will have minus E minus p, because the difference is i pi. So the total energy momentum is zero. So these two particles can annihilate. And this pole is related precisely to the annihilation of these two particles. This is why the residue is related to the form factor with n particles, in which these two, the first two, have disappeared due to the annihilation. And then the precise form of the residue includes this factor, 1 minus product or the scattering amplitudes with the remaining particles. So again, pictorially, this is the following. So I have my matrix element. And here I will have theta 1, theta n. Uh, and then I add these two additional particles which annihilate each other, so I, uh, I represent this annihilation like this. So this is one path for the annihilation, but I could take another path, which is this. This is always theta 1, theta n. So this could... could go this way. Uh, when I do this, then I will have all this scattering amplitude. So this, the equation says that the residue is uh, given by the difference of these two possibilities. Of course, I'm not proving this. I'm just giving you the idea of what's going on. And uh, uh, in the next lecture, I will show you the physical, a physical implication of these uh, annihilation poles. So I will show you if they are not there, you are in trouble with physics. Then there is the last equation, which uh, so pictorially is the following. Suppose I have a matrix element with theta 1 theta n minus 1, and then uh, I have other two particles, theta n and theta n plus 1. And suppose I go, for the last two rapidities, I go to a difference which corresponds to the formation of a bound state among them. So in such a way that I get something like this. So here I have my three-particle coupling gamma. So again, so when I go to a bound state here, I will, I will have the bound state pole that the form factor inherits from the S matrix. And the equation associated to this is quite natural. So it's a fourth equation, fourth and last, which says that the residue on this pole, theta n minus theta n plus 1, equal this resonance value of the matrix element with n plus 1 particles, theta 1, theta n plus 1. This is I, the gamma, the coupling at the vertex, and then I'm left with an object. You see, I started with n plus 1 particle, but I fused two of them, so I'm left here with matrix element with n particles, and rapidity theta 1, theta n minus 1, and an additional rapidity theta determined by energy momentum conservation. Yeah. Okay, so this is the set of equations satisfied 
by mm, the form factors in integrable theories. And again, what you want to do is to uh, solve these equations uh, once you have uh, a theory uh, for which you know the S matrix. So if you know S, this is the, amplitude, the, the input to go and solve these equations. Now I will illustrate how this works uh, for the case of the easy model, which is the one which minimizes the technicalities because S is just minus one, but at the same time allows to explain uh, the logic uh, in a complete way. Now in the easy model there are no bound states, so this equation will play no role. I get rid of it immediately. So, I want to do easing, which may means S of theta equal minus one. Uh, I have to distinguish, uh, as we learned, uh, the two cases, theta, uh, T larger than Tc and T smaller than Tc. I start with the T larger than Tc. Uh, so this is a phase uh, which is disordered, and so here uh, the excitations will be local wi with respect to the spin, and in particular the spin can be taken as uh, a creation of a uh, field for the particle, and uh, so uh, the particle A I have here has the symmetry of sigma, then is odd, under the spin reversal symmetry. So it's Z2 odd. And this is why the, I will be looking for the uh, form factor the order parameter, which is the most interesting case. So on an even number of particles, this matrix element will be zero by symmetry. So I have to look for the odd ones for which I have these three equations. Now, we understand that uh, these are, so I'm, I'm saying what is the symmetry, in which symmetry sector I'm looking for a solution. But of course, there are infinitely many fields in the theory with this uh, symmetry. For example, sigma, but also all the descendants of sigma. They are always all odd under Z2. And so this is why uh, it one has to expect that these solutions have infinitely many, these equations have infinitely many solutions in this symmetry sector. And indeed, this is uh, what happens. But uh, here you can observe, for example, that suppose I take the matrix element of the derivative of sigma. This Well, this is, you can easily see that uh, taking the derivatives of, of the field, that this, when I take one rapidity to infinity, say one rapidity tie to infinity, this will behave like e to the k t i time fn sigma. So this, this is just uh, an example of descendant fields in, in which you see that going up with the level of the descendants, you get solutions. So this will be theta one, theta n. You get solutions uh, whose asymptotic behavior at large energy is, uh, I mean, uh, the here the the power will be the exponent will be larger and larger. So it grows with the level. 
So this means that quite naturally, and this can be shown in detail, uh, the primary field, sigma, is the one is corresponds to the solution of these equations with the mildest asymptotic behavior at infinity, at large energy. Okay, so this is quite natural from here, but as I said, it can be also formally shown. Uh, so if you add this piece of information, so sigma uh, fn sigma of mildest asymptotic or large energy behavior. With this additional piece of information, on, uh, on top of the equations, you can uh, see that there is a single solution at this point. I write this solution that you can easily check, satisfies all the equations. So it, it is on the odd number of particles. <coughs> so it has i to the k f1 sigma and then product i smaller than j hyperbolic tangent theta you see this factor here as these poles when the rapidity difference is in i pi this annihilation poles and you can check the residues are okay with s equal minus one. This f1 is the one particle from factor which by relativistic invariance is a constant. So this is the, uh, the solution, the, the, the construction of the field sigma at above Tc. We can now uh, see what happens below Tc. Uh, so I erase this. We saw that the difference here is now is that the excitations are kinks. Uh, so this means that actually we have to adapt here our notations. Well, let me say also another thing. So the, the excitations are kinks. So the kinks have a topological charge. Uh, so they are not created by sigma. Sigma carry no topological charge. These kinks will be created by another field, which in the scheme of duality, which is behind this, is called the disorder field, which carries a uh, topological charge. But without going into this detail, the important point is that sigma couples to states with zero topological charge, which correspond to taking kink and taking and repeating this pairing n times in general. So it couples to even number of particles below Tc. So it will be F2k sigma of theta1, theta2k. And this is something we read as, now we have two vacua, so we have to choose one on which to, to, to start. Then we have the field, and then we have the states which are of the form k plus minus theta 1, k minus plus theta 2, until k uh, minus plus theta 2k. So these are our objects below to see. Uh, so everything works actually mostly in the same way, with some small change. 
In particular, look at the equation here, equation 2. In equation 2, if we look uh, uh, pictorially now in, uh, with this kink excitations, what this means, we have to do something like that. So we have the rapidity here is theta 1 plus i pi, theta 2, theta 2k. And uh, we are working with the plus vacuum as an external vacuum. So this is, here I have plus. So this force this to be minus, then plus. This is plus to finish, and this is minus. So I'm working with this configuration of the vacuum. Uh, and the equation says that this is equal to the, the case in which I have brought the, uh, this particle, which was first here, becomes the last in the, in the new configuration. This is theta 2k, and then this is theta 1 minus i pi. Okay, so the equation is equating these two objects. But now, here, so theta 2 was a, a kink between minus and plus. So here I have minus, plus, and so on and so forth. I have to finish with minus. So this is plus, this is minus. So theta 1 was always plus, minus, as you see. So uh, in writing the equation here, I have a change in the from plus vacuum as external vacuum to minus. But this using the symmetry, Z2 symmetry, I can do a Z2 transformation and rewrite this as so the field is odd under Z2, so I get the minus, and then uh, I get here theta two, theta two K, theta one minus five pi. And here again with plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. Okay, so I did this example in detail to say that due to the kink nature of the particles below Tc, in this equation, here you pick up a minus, which is this one. So you pick up a minus there in the equation 2, and similarly, you can, uh, there is a similar reasoning which uh, induce a, a change of sign here. You pick up another minus here. Th this become one plus product. It's the same mechanism. Uh, so you have to solve this, the, the, the equations with this little sign modifications. And once you do this, you get a solution which is pretty similar to the, the one I had above PC, uh, above TC, which is now this. But this on even number of particles. I to the power K, F0, sigma. This F0 sigma is the uh, form factor with zero particles, namely the vacuum expectation value of sigma, namely the spontaneous magnetization, and then product i less than j theta uh, hyperbolic tangent theta i minus theta j over 2. So very similar to the, other, uh, to the one about TC, but now with even number of particles. Okay, so we got the, uh, starting with the same amplitude, S equal minus one, we got different solutions for the matrix element of the spin or the or order parameter in the two phases. And th this must be different because the correlation functions are not the same uh, in the two phases. So now you can compute the correlation functions, as I said, expanding such an expression over these matrix elements. So uh, you get, of course, is an infinite series. Uh, 
you have to sum over n the number of particles for all n to have the exact. This is something you can do here. Uh, you know all the uh, these form factors for any number of particles. This resummation, the, the expression here are sufficiently simple. You can resum the series. And people found that the correlation functions uh, for this model can be written as solutions of a differential equation of the pan levé type. So it's kind, kind of miracle of resummation of this kind of series. The point is that uh, in uh, other models in which uh, the, the dynamics I is not free, but like the three state pots model or St. Gordon, uh, the, the expressions for the formats will be more complicated because here this S is not a constant. You get something more complicated in the solution. So it is still possible to compute all the form factors, but normally you are not able to resum this series. So what you can do in practice, what you do in practice is to t take partial sums. And uh, uh, taking partial sums, of course, uh, you have to check uh, how fast this kind of uh, partial sums approach the, uh, the, tr the true result. So how fast is the convergence of this kind of series? Now I give you uh, one example. <coughs> oh. So this game I just illustrated for easy model can be repeated, for example, for the Q-state POTS model. So I take Q-state POTS. So I take here Q. Here I take field theory. So the approach I've just shown, but I work with what I call the two-particle approximation. Two-particle approximation means that I approximate the correlator, inserting here the sum over n up to two particles. So I cut it very short, as, as you can see. And, uh, and then I see what happens and compare with the results I get from, say, lattice computations. I will do this for, you remember in the first lecture we introduced the susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility, and we say this behaves near to criticality with some amplitudes, gamma plus, gamma minus, T minus TC to a critical exponent minus gamma when T goes to TC. And we say that gamma plus over gamma minus is universal <coughs> and uh, uh, needs to be computed in the off-critical theory because this knows about the approach to criticality. But now, uh, I mean, with this, for example, in this model, with this form factors we computed, we, we can, the susceptibility, I, I remind you, was, this is just integral the 2x sigma x sigma z. So th this is what I compute precisely with this matrix element of sigma. Uh, so I do this in the two phases, above and below Tc, uh, with this approximation. So for the case I've just shown you, Q 
q equal to this model, you get in this two particle approximation, you get 37.699. From th I told you that we know exactly the, the resummation in this case, so we can compare it with the exact result. Uh, and the exact result is 37.6936, and so on. So this means that this two-party approximation actually saturates immediately the full sum. So you can rely on it uh, quite generally. And I, as you understand, it becomes a very quick uh, approach because you just need to work up to two particles. You don't need to find complete solutions for this. And so, for example, you can go to the three state pots model. You get TR 1385 to be compared with. Now, on the lattice, we don't have the exact results on the lattice either, but you have r results from series expansions, Monte Carlo, things like that. And this is plus or minus point zero eight. You can also go to Q equal four. Yeah, get this to be compared with three point nine. And for Q equal one, you get under sixty point two. Under sixty two point five. So, okay, uh, Q equal 1, what's Q equal 1? Q equal 1 is percolation, but, uh, uh, so in percolation, the magnetic susceptibility, uh, percolation is not a magnetic model, so we are computing something that needs to be uh, in reinterpreted in percolation. So the computation is this. But what they are doing is the following. So in percolation, our we had introduced this order para uh, parameter field, which was delta sigma of x comma alpha minus 1 over q at the point x. So this is checking whether the spin at site x as color alpha or not. On the other end, if I consider this expectation value, S of x1, comma alpha, delta of s2, comma alpha, this is the probability that the spins at site x1 and x2 have the same color alpha. So I have the two spins, x1, x2. I check the probability they have the same color alpha. But now uh, I have two possibilities in terms of the cluster, the composition of the POTS model that we saw at the very beginning of these lectures. So one possibility is that these two points belong in the cluster decomposition to the same cluster. And then, uh, so I call P2 of X1 and X2. This is probability X1, X2 in same cluster. Okay, but so this is the probability that they are in the same cluster, but if it, they are in the same cluster, they will have the same color, but still there are Q colors. So I get the factor 1 over Q, at least this is in the unbroken phase T larger than TC. Well, the, the symmetry is not broken. There are Q colors, e each one with probability 1 over Q. Then I have the second possibility is that they do not belong to the same cluster. So 
this is the probability they do not belong in the same class. But so this time they are like this. But so each one can have one of Q colors. So I get one over Q from each cluster, so one over Q squared. So in this way, I represent this spin correlator in terms of this so-called P2 is called the two-point connectivity for percolation. In the limit, Q going to one is percolation. Now, if you use this sigma alpha, this becomes sigma alpha of x1, sigma alpha of x2 equal Q minus one P2 x1, x2. So it gives me a relation between the correlation function of the other parameter in the POTS model and the connectivity of percolation. So when I compute this uh, susceptibility, in the POTS case will be in general sigma alpha, sigma alpha. So I'm integrating over this, but which means I'm integrating over the probability that they are in the same cluster. So what I get is the mean sides of clusters. So chi this is proportional. I, get, I have this Q minus one, which will cancel in the ratio. This is proportional to mean, mean cluster sides. Okay, so this number here is the ratio of mean cluster sizes in percolation on the two sides of the transition. And you see that the, these two numbers are very different. This is the mean size of finite clusters, of course. Below TC, TC, which for percolation means above the critical occupation probability PC, I also have an infinite cluster. but. I can repeat this below TC, and this will continue to hold with for finite clusters. So this is the ratio of uh, the mean sides of finite clusters in percolation in the two uh, regimes. And as you see, uh, the field theory in this approximation already is sufficient to reproduce this uh, lattice result, which, by the way, is a very recent, sufficiently recent numerical result, because uh, it happens that for numerical reasons, uh, this number has been mysterious for at least 30 years. So there, there are published results ranging, ranging from one, order one to order 100. So many of them. So it's been a mysterious number for many, many years. And so only recently both uh, lattice uh, numerics and uh, theory uh, showed that this is the right number. OK, so this is uh, enough for this illustration. And uh, uh, next time, we will give uh, some other applications of, of this formalism. Thank you. Any question? Well, we can go for lunch.